going to be dealing with uh, topics, the origin of life, and just want you to get your, uh, your mental steering wheel spinning. Evolution is a fact. It's a fact which is established as securely as essentially any other fact that we have in science. Let's assume that evolution does lots of things, but what it doesn't do is explain the existence of the mutating replicator on which it depends. Key element in Darwin's theory, the origin of a new species, the title of his book, has never been solved. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. What was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone no. else. There's a consistent group of people, among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists, who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. It is completely right to say that since the evidence for evolution is so absolutely, totally overwhelming, nobody who looks at it could possibly doubt that if they were sane uh, and not stupid. Lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated? It's absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures, John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. So you think the whole theory of evolution is false or just certain parts of it? Well, again, evolution is a slippery word. I would say minor changes within species happen. But Darwin didn't write a book called How Species, How Existing Species Change Over Time. He wrote a book called The Origin of Species. He purported oh. to show how this same process I leads to new species, in I fact, see. every species. And the evidence for that grand claim is, in my opinion, almost totally lacking. Richard Dawkins, in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, said that evolution is the explanation for the existence and variation of all of life. That is false because the existence of life is not explained by biological evolution. One of, one of my um, prevailing doctrines about Darwinian theory is, man, that, that thing is just a mess. It's like looking into a room full of smoke. We just haven't been lucky enough to uh, pick up the uh, critical evidence. Darwinism, strictly defined, starts after the origin of life. Suppose we find, simply as a matter of fact, that our scientific inquiries point in one direction. Which is that there is an creator. intelligent creator. Why should we eliminate that from discussion? String verboten? How come? Why? String verboten. Very good. What does string verboten mean? Strongly forbidden. Strongly forbidden. Religion. I mean, it's just fantasy, basically. It's completely empty of any explanatory content. And it's evil as well. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have written that uh, God is a psychotic delinquent invented by mad, deluded people. No, I didn't say quite that. I said something rather better than that. Oh, well, please tell us <laughs> what you said. Please tell us what um, you said. I, well, I would have to read it from, from, from the book. No, please. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. I, I never hated religion. I found religion quite comfortable and I liked the people in it. Uh, what led to the atheism was learning more about science, learning more about the natural world, and seeing these horrible conflicts with religion. I think that God is about as unlikely as fairies, angels, uh, hobgoblins, etc. What we are finding is that there's information that's in the cell that cannot be accounted for in terms of these undirected material causes. So there's, it has uh, to be. And, and so there's, there's yeah. some, some other, so there's, there has to be an information source. So one of the key questions faced by 
modern biology is, where do you get information from? Well, uh, Darwin assumed that the increase in information comes from natural selection. But natural selection reduces genetic information, and we know this from all the genetic population studies that we have. And where is the new genetic information going to come from? Well, that's the big question. So when we find information in the DNA molecule, the most likely explanation is that it too had an intelligent source. And I think it's just a, a catastrophic mistake to have someone like Dawkins uh, address himself to profound issues of theology, the existence of God, the nature of life. He hasn't committed himself to discipline study in any relevant area of inquiry. He's a crummy philosopher. He doesn't have the rudimentary skills to, to, to meticulously assess his own arguments. Genius guy, though. Very smart guy. A little bit of a reptile, but very smart guy. Well, does someone have a theory about how life began? In the beginning, God said, It began in the sea some 3,000 million years ago. Complex chemical molecules began to clump together to form microscopic blobs, cells. These were the seeds from which the tree of life developed. Why don't you believe that? Huh? Well, I'm just wondering, why don't you believe that you could pass down a gene that would eventually evolve into a race of supermen? Why? Oh, that's a silly question. <laughs> because evolution doesn't exist, of course. I'm sorry? Oh, could you repeat that again for the room? Because evolution is bullshit. It's not real. Damn it, recess! Look, you're wasting our time. You're not gonna get us to not believe in evolution. And why is that? Because the smartest scientists in the entire world all agree that it's real. Science is a liar sometimes. Oh, boy. This is Aristotle, thought to be the smartest man on the planet. He believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, and everybody believed him because he was so smart. Until another smartest guy came around, Galileo, and he disproved that theory making Aristotle and everybody else on Earth look like a bitch. Of course, Galileo then thought comets were an optical illusion, and there's no way that the moon could cause the ocean's tides. Everybody believed that because he was so smart. He was also wrong, making him and everyone else on Earth look like a bitch again. And then, best of all, Sir Isaac Newton gets born and blows everybody's nips off with his big brains. Of course, he also thought he could turn metal into gold and died eating mercury, making him yet another stupid bitch. Are you seeing a pattern? No. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, these were all the smartest scientists on the planet. Only problem is they kept being wrong. Sometimes. Now, this is insane, you fool. I'm a fool because I have more faith in the saints that wrote the Bible? Yeah, because you just read the words of a bunch of guys that you never met 
and you just take it on faith that everything they wrote was true. Mm. And what makes you think what your scientists are writing is any more truer than my saints? Because there are volumes of proven data, numbers, you know, figures. Th th there are fossil records. Oh, fossil records. Ah! I didn't even think about the fossil records. I guess I'll concede. Oh, wait, well, one more thing before I do, Mr. Reynolds. Have you seen these fossil records? Have I s Huh? Have you poured through the data yourself? The numbers, the figures? Well, no, I mean, no. Oh, interesting. So let me get this straight, Mr. Reynolds. You get your information from a book written by men you've never met, and you take their words as truth based on a willingness to believe, a desire to accept, a leap of, oof, dare I say it, <laughs> faith? Ah, come on, come on. Look, I mean, I don't even know how I'm supposed to respond to that. Like, ah, come on. That is a, that's a false equivalency. Just answer the question, Mr. Reynolds. Sure, yeah, okay. I rest my case. <laughs> Well, that got me. Yeah. Uh, Frank, you want me to? Put me over. Yeah, all right. What? Well, we're going on the fence. I mean, that's a shadow of a doubt. You actually don't believe in evolution anymore? I don't know. He created a reasonable doubt. He makes you sound like a stupid uh, science bitch. Yeah, that's good. Oh, my God. Well, in 1973, I was a postdoc uh, in molecular biology at Columbia University. And it, it was a time, really, of... Uh, of uh, a lot of intense discussion. I had a lot of friends who were postdocs. Subjects came up naturally, and um, I just happened to come across um, a copy of the Wistar Symposium that was held in 1966 in Philadelphia. It's a collection of essays about Darwinian uh, theory, uh, and I read Murray Eden's article, a critical art article about Darwinian theory, and. Uh, Marcel Schutzenberger's critical argument about uh, Darwinian theory. And I started talking about it with um, the other postdoctoral fellows, people who were working in the laboratory at the time. And I discovered somewhat to my own um, surprise that the, the arguments, which seemed so very credible, very important, uh, went virtually unanswered uh, among the biologists that I knew, uh, who tended to dismiss the arguments in a way that suggested that they hadn't really understood them, and if they had understood them, were not prepared to respond to them. And that was, that was the beginning of uh, my skepticism about Darwinian theory. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalist stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. You turn to the serious sciences, you turn to general relativity or quantum mechanics. I can program a computer with the equations of general relativity or with the equations of quantum mechanics and I can say, all right, what are the consequences? I can actually see the consequences uh, emerge in a simulation. We can't do any of this in biology. And that, that should, should prompt any reasonable person to ask, why not? If this is such a simple mechanism, could easily be programmed on a computer. How come we can't set up a computer and create something of biological-like complexity? How come we cannot see the unfolding of an evolutionary process the way we can see the unfolding of an evolutionary process in physics? This is a very serious question. I've looked at all the genetic algorithms. I'm trying to write a genetic algorithm myself. And, uh, and the sheer fact is, uh, without a tremendous amount of very special man manipulation and ad hoc constraints, the computer is not going to generate anything realistic if it uses Darwinian mechanisms, and it will generate something realistic only if it doesn't use Darwinian mechanisms. This is an important point. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it. Don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. We're dealing with a collection of anecdotes, a, a certain point of view, a series of hunches. Um, I would say that the, the most outstanding, the salient points are, first of all, the fossil record, uh, which, is, which is simply mystifying. We can't make much sense of the fossil record. It does not sustain any kind of Darwinian prediction that can be intelligently derived from Darwinian theory. Where exactly in the fossil record is the evidence for progressive evolution? The transitional forms between the major groups? You know, most of them, come to think of it, 
are fully formed kinds in their own right. This conversation with the young lady went on for approximately three hours, during which time, again, we, we entertain these questions. And the whole time I'm answering, I'm listening to my own responses and trying not to betray this to the student was rapidly concluding that this is not making good scientific sense. What I'm telling this young lady and what I told the students this morning is not good science. So far, I guess we just haven't been lucky enough to uh, pick up the uh, critical evidence. To my way of thinking, if Darwinian hypotheses are correct, it should suggest an enormous plethora of animals intermediary between, say, Ambulocetus and the next step. Everyone familiar with the paleontological literature, every significant paleontologist says that there are gaps in the fossil record. Do you have a particular reason for demurring? No, but there are gaps so, in the fossil record, of course, because the fossil record's only been examined for about 130 years. I didn't ask whether there was an explanation years. for the gaps. I asked whether you agree that the fossil record is full of gaps. Of course it has gaps. Okay, so the, to that extent, the evidence does not support Darwin's theory of evolution. No, that is absolutely wrong. It because follows we... as the night the day. Where exactly in the fossil record is the evidence for progressive evolution? The transitional forms between the major groups? You know, most of them come to think of it are fully formed kinds in their own right. All I'm asking for is enlightenment on the significant point. Darwin's theory requires a continuous, a multitude of continuous forms. We do not see that in the fossil record. In fact, major transitions are utterly incomplete. Will you accept that as, a, as an empirical fact? Now, now, you sound like a guy who is writing a story about baseball, comes in in the fourth inning and says, well, you know, I'm going to write about the fourth inning on. The first three innings didn't happen because I wasn't there to see them. The fact that we can't find every one of those we intermediate fossils yet in 150... We can't of find course any we of find the major them. transitions. It's just that when There's we find them, Doctor, the the you say it's still not enough. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. You've got a cow. You want to teach it how to live all of its life in the open ocean, still retaining its air-breathing characteristics. What do you have to do from an engineering point of view to change the cow into a whale? This is crude, but it gives you the essential idea. Now, if the same question were raised with respect to uh, a car, and you ask what would it take to change a car into a submarine, we would understand immediately it would take a great many changes. The project is a massive, a massive engineering project of redesign and adaptation. Well, the same question occurs with respect to that proverbial cow. Virtually every feature of the cow has to be changed, it has to be adapted. But since we know that life on Earth and life in the water are fundamentally different enterprises, the skin has to, has to change completely. It has to become Im impermeable to water. That's one change. Breathing apparatus has to, has to change. A diving apparatus has to be put in place. Lactation systems have to be designed. The eyes have to be protected. The hearing has to be altered. Salivary organs have to be changed. Feeding mechanisms have to be changed. After all, a cow eats grass, a whale doesn't. As I say, I've tried to do some of these calculations. The calculations are certainly, certainly not hard. But they're interesting because I stopped at 50,000. That is morphological changes. And don't forget these changes are not independent. They're all linked. If you change an organism's visual system, you have to change a great many parts of its cerebellum, its cerebrum, its, its nervous system. Um, all of these changes are coordinated. So when we're talking about an evolutionary sequence such as this, what's interesting about the cow to whale transition, and I'm just using this as a easily accessible idea. What's interesting about the cow to whale transition is that we can see a different environment is going to impose severe design constraints on a possible evolutionary sequence. How are these constraints met if they're roughly 50,000? If they're 2 million constraints, how are those met? And what does this suggest about what we should see in the fossil record? Why do you say that the theory in itself makes so little sense? Well, what's it say? Whatever survives, survives. No, I knew that before. Because it's tautological. I didn't even have to study Darwin. It's tautological. It's empty. 
It's empty. It's empty. It doesn't tell us anything. Yeah, it survives. Well, I'll believe that. But that's not a theory. That's just a, a string of wet sponges on a clothesline. That doesn't tell us anything deep about biological structure. Yeah, a lot of variations. Children don't look exactly like their parents, thank goodness. And their children will be slightly different too. But does that tell us why startling, complex structures arise in the history of life? We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an and intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some yeah. sort of designer. Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but okay. that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. Aliens? I thought we were talking about science, not science fiction. We don't know what caused life to arise. Was, did it arise by a purely undirected process? Or did it arise by some kind of intelligent guidance or design? And the rules of science are, are being applied to actually foreclose one of the possible, one of the two possible answers to that very fundamental and basic and important question. So the rules of science say we will consider any possibility except one that is guided. Exactly. Suppose we find, simply as a matter of fact, that our scientific inquiries point in one direction. Which is that there is an creator. intelligent creator. Why should we eliminate that from discussion? Streng verboten? How come? Why? Streng verboten. Very good. What does streng verboten mean? Strongly forbidden. Strongly forbidden. Science is science. Science deals with the real world, with real phenomena. Uh, we don't bring into such discussions inferences of supernatural. What triggered life here is still a mystery, but there are several theories. The most common one is that life began purely by accident in pools of primordial soup full of chemicals called amino acids. These molecules would have collided at random for millions of years until the perfect combination just happened. The probability of a single protein being formed by undirected natural processes is only 1 in 10 to the 164th power. That's 10 with 164 zeros following it. That's pretty big. The probability of life, a simple cell evolving by undirected natural processes, is 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Here we have one tiny grain of sand. It's been estimated that there are one million grains of sand in a half a cup. It would take one million half cups of sand to fill a swimming pool that's six feet deep and 30 feet in diameter. Now, if we took one billion of these pools of sand, we could fill Lake Tahoe in Nevada, which is about 22 miles long and 12 miles wide. Think you could find that original grain of sand we started with? We're not done yet. It would take about one billion Lake Tahoes to fill the volume of the Earth with sand. The probability of grabbing that original grain of sand out of the Earth filled with sand is 1 in 10 to the 30th power. It would take 100 million Earths to fill one sun with sand, and 1 trillion suns to fill our solar system, 10 trillion solar systems to fill one cubic light year, 
100 trillion cubic light years to fill the volume of the Milky Way galaxy, and finally 10 billion Milky Way galaxies to fill the observable universe. Whew. That is a lot of sand. The probability of now randomly picking our original grain of sand from the entire observable universe is 1 in 10 to the 96th power. Still a far cry from our protein being formed at 1 in 10 to the 164th power and even less chance of life evolving from undirected natural processes at the probability of 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Scientists generally consider anything with a probability of less than one part in 10 to the 70th power operationally impossible. When I said that uh, however improbable the origin of life might be, even if this is the only planet in the universe that has life, I was invoking the anthropic principle. I was invoking the idea that because we are here, we are alive, we are thinking about it, then however improbable the origin of life was, however improbable the origin of intelligence was, it has to have happened at least once because here we are thinking about it. That I find actually a rather satisfying account. I don't believe it because I think that life is much more improbable than that. But even if we are the only planet in the universe that has life, I myself am satisfied by the, by the anthropic principle for accounting for the fact that we have life here. Hmm. Those are pretty formidable odds, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But the fact remains is that we're here. And in reality, the only way we could have gotten here is through the evolutionary process. So the fact that we're here really proves evolution, doesn't it? Hmm. And these are the events, molecular events, genetic events, that were mechanisms part and parcel of the evolutionary process. I could buffalo a student when I felt myself get a little bit in trouble, okay? I'd had a few years experience at this, okay? It's a trade secret. But for the first time maybe in my life in explaining various facets of evolution theory, I began to listen to what I was saying. And what I was saying wasn't making very good scientific sense. The ultimate lucky break that started the chain of life. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, uh, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. It is extremely unlikely that life could spontaneously create itself. But I don't think that's a problem with this theory. But there is another intriguing idea called panspermia, which says that life could have originated somewhere else and have been spread from planet to planet by asteroids. It seems possible that lumps of rock could carry frozen organisms inside them. Organisms able to withstand extremes of temperature and the vacuum of space. If so, asteroids could even now be transporting life to other worlds. Regardless of which theory is right, once life begins, the next chapter starts, and that's all about survival. Survival demands a source of energy, what we call food, or else it would grind to a halt. Once nourished, life can then copy itself to protect against the death of any one individual. Ultimately, that leads to evolution. Let's assume that evolution does lots of things. But what it doesn't do is explain the existence of the mutating replicator on which it depends. And that mutating replicator 
is a micro-miniaturized factory of unbelievable sophistication. Darwin wrote uh, The Origin of Species in 1859, published it in 1859. He had an idea of the cell as being quite simple, correct? Yeah, everybody did. Yeah, okay. If, if he thought of the cell as being a Buick, what is the cell now in terms of its complexity by comparison? A galaxy. If Darwin thought a cell was, say, a mud hut, what do we now know that a cell is? more complicated than uh, a Saturn V. So what is in a cell as far as we know now? A world that Darwin never could have imagined. This small animal from the world of the microscope consists of only one cell formed of protoplasm, that mysterious substance of which all living cells in plants and animals are made. In protoplasm is the secret of life. We know much about its physical and chemical nature, but we've not been able to solve the basic riddle of what gives it life. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing 
And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. In the textbooks, they talk about the nucleus controlling the cell. And that's in today's textbooks in grammar school through medical school. And the nucleus has the DNA, and the DNA is believed to be the control. As I said before, every function in your body is already present in every cell. So where you have an organ in your body, the cell has an organelle, which means miniature organ. So the textbooks talk about the nucleus is equal to the brain. Uh, watch. If you remove the brain from an organism, the organism dies. But if you remove a nucleus from a cell, the cell lives and the behavior is unaffected. Some cells can live two or more months with no genes, and they carry out all of their normal functions. So enucleation is not removing the brain. So the nucleus is not the brain. But the nucleus does something. When you take out a nucleus, the cell cannot reproduce its parts or itself. So the nucleus is not the brain. The nucleus is the gonad. Since science is a male uh, business, and since men think with this organ, they <laughs> made it the brain of the cell. The nucleus does not control the cell. The nucleus is reproduction of the parts. In my research, 40 years ago, I started working with stem cells. People think that stem cells are something new. My research, early, early research, I have a tissue culture with multi-potential stem cells. These are clones, meaning they're all genetically identical. In my experiment, I take a group of cells, so I take this group of cells and put it into another Petri dish with a different environment, environment A. And environment A, the conditions of the medium, the stem cells form muscle. But I could go back and take the very same genetically identical cells and put them into culture dish with environment B and the cells form bone. Or I could go and take the very same cells and put them in culture dish C with a different environment and the cells form fat. What controls the fate of the cell? The environment. They were genetically identical, only the environment was different. So I published this work in 1977. My colleagues were not interested in this work because they were interested in the human genome. So I left the uni I left, I had tenure, and I walked out of the university as a professor. I left the university because they were not being scientific because they didn't want to understand this. So I end up at a better university, the Stanford University Medical School. Uh, there I repeat the experiments, but more sophisticated. And I uh, get the cover of the journal, uh, Differentiation. Again, the scientists were not interested. So I left the university for the second time. And I write my book on the biology of how cells work. One of the most prestigious journals in the world, Nature, five months after my, my book, an article call about stem cells are engaged in a constant crosstalk with their environment Biologists are fast realizing, no, some of them not too fast. But we went and looked for, um, to find all of the genes that make up a human. And the Human Genome Project was going to be the last biology project. Because once we knew all of the genes, then we would be able to control anything in a human being. It takes one gene to make a protein. There are 150,000 different proteins. How many genes do you need? It takes one gene to make a protein. There are 150,000 different proteins. How many genes do you need? 150,000.
How many genes did we find in the Human Genome Project? 23,000. There's a problem. There are not enough genes to make a human being. So what is wrong is our belief. We are completely wrong about our belief that genes control life. Every cell in your body is doing complex activity, not because of you, isn't it? The source of creation is functioning through that. Every atom, all this complex moment of proton, neutron, electron happening, you doing it? The hand of the creator is very much in it, so every atom is a doorway to the beyond. The language of life, the genetic code is extremely ancient according to what we're told. It's scarcely changed at all and that raises immense questions as to how it could possibly have developed. Here we have the famous DNA double helix. You can see the two helical strands that are intertwined and wind around each other on the outside of the molecule. This is the material that stores all of our genetic information. In higher life forms, this will be the equivalent of something like a gigabyte of information stored in the molecules that form the individual chromosomes, all packed within the nucleus, which is a tiny fraction of the entire cell size. So what does DNA do? Well, the information in DNA ends up providing the information for sequencing the amino acids to make protein. So we have information in a one-dimensional form that provides the information for a three-dimensional form. What we are finding is that there's information that's in the cell that cannot be accounted for in terms of these undirected material causes. So there has to be. And so there's, there's yeah. some, some other, so there has to be an information source. So one of the key questions faced by modern biology is, where do you get information from? Well, uh, Darwin assumed that the increase in information comes from natural selection. But natural selection reduces genetic information. And we know this from all the genetic population studies that we have. And where is the new genetic information going to come from? Well, that's the big question. The DNA carries uh, digital information effectively on every single strand of the DNA. There is coded information. Coded information implies that there must have been a programmer. You hear this one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really, let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Science demonstrates that over time, living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, Follow along if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't, plain and simple. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, or, or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Can you just stop by that? Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Before that, you could be an atheist, Hume was, for example, but it was quite difficult because you had no good explanation for why uh, living things look so well designed. Darwin provided that. Wait, what, what does the Darwinian theory say? What is the Darwin Darwinian anecdote? There are arbitrary changes 
meaning the changes are perfectly random. We have no idea when they will occur, and they're not linked to changes that have occurred. And after the changes have occurred, there's a deterministic process which calls out those changes that are valuable and saves those changes uh, which are not, uh, and extrudes those changes which are not. So the process is both one of sheer dumb luck, finding the right changes, and something that is not quite a matter of luck, that is quite deterministic, that is saving the valuable changes. Nonetheless, Darwinian theory suggests that each such episode, luck, change, luck, change, is independent. It has nothing to do with the one that went before. So that in the abstract, it could be modeled by what mathematicians call a random variable. At, a, at first cut, first approximation. When I talk about sheer dumb luck, I mean the amazing fact that these extraordinary, ineffably beautiful structures arise from what is at its heart a stochastic, that is to say, a random process. But the essential point is that the structure of the theory is uh, arguably stochastic. Each event, each episode, each bright, bursting episode of change is independent of the one that went before and independent of the one that's going to come after. That's what I meant by sheer dumb luck. Everybody, creationists, evolutionists, we all agree that natural selection is a fact. All natural selection is, is nature choosing or selecting the most desirable characteristics in a certain population of animals, creatures. Right. So what happens, you know, I could give you a basic analogy, the one that I heard in high school, right. is the wolf analogy. Mm -hmm. So you have a population of wolves, and then suddenly the environment gets really, really cold. So then what happens is that only those wolves that happen to have thicker coats survive. So right. in time, all of the wolves have thicker coats, and they call that evolution. But is that really evolution in the context they want you to believe in? Right. So right. what happened there was that there was already that trait of thicker coats pre-existent in that population of wolves. Right. Right. And then what happened is that that particular trait, just like you know the cattle breeding analogy, was selected by nature, you could say, and then amplified in the population. Right. And so that's something that nobody would debate. Now, what people do debate is, can that process cause non-living elements to arise into living things? Right. Or can a single cell using that process turn uh, all the way into every different type of species that you see? And, and that's where the big controversy is. It's a big, uh, I would say, it's being intellectually dishonest to equate the two. But what inference do you make from the fact that, say, the fin in a fish is um, structured in a way that's remarkably similar to the hand in a human or in, in a chimpanzee? If the fact that you see some morphological si significance is taken as evidence for common descent, there's not much additional that you need to look for by way of evidence because the issue is definitional. If it's not taken as evidence for common descent, what do you need to complete the inference to common descent? Um, there are plenty of, plenty of examples of homological structures in biology which are obviously not based on, on common descent. For example, take the Australian wolf, um, which except for the reproductive system, um, features a wide variety of organ systems that are absolutely homological to the North American timber wolf. But there's no evidence that these homological structures arose because some wolf at some time in the past or some uh, proto-wolf um, decided first to migrate to Australia and then to migrate to North America. The evolutionary lines are completely distinct, and yet we see a profound degree of homology. We see this throughout the animal kingdom. Um, the whole issue of homology, commonality of form, is riddled with a, a, a great deal of, of philosophical uncertainty because it's never clear what the evidence is, what the evidence is for, and how one is to avoid completely circular reasoning. What is clear, what is clear is that within family groupings, there are profound similarities in structure. We can say that, but whether they arise because of some constraints in the, in the circumstances of life, or because there's a genuine explanation in terms of a common ancestor, we just don't know in many cases. Uh, the entire mammalian 
um, group of animals, for example, all of the mammals, have many, many properties in common. Why this should be, we don't know. For example, the, the pentapod nature of uh, all extremities. Um, why is five preferred in the mammalian kingdom and not seven or 13 or 52? It's, it's an obviously interesting question. By the way, the bones develop from different genes in these different organisms. They are not homologous organisms like they want you to believe. Uh, if we say that it is because the mammalian, um, mammalian organisms were derived ultimately from fish, then we have a profound number of problems in that uh, pectoral and pelvic girdles also obey the rule of five. They also obey the rule of five. Where did this constraint come from? It's not entirely clear. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. See, dogs produce dogs, and you might get quite a variety of dogs. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but you're always going to get a dog when you crossbreed your dogs. That's not evolution, that's just a variation of the same kind, okay? And the information for that variety was already present in the gene pool. No new information is ever added. See, variations happen within the dog kind. You get a big dog or a little dog, but there are limits to these variations. Haven't the farmers been trying to breed for bigger pigs for a long time? They try to get the biggest pig they can, don't they? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? <laughs> I bet there's a limit in there somewhere, isn't there? Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop a chihuahua. And the gene pool of the new variety is now more limited than before. Genetic information was lost when you got your variation. It wasn't added. You might have selected a certain slice of the gene pool with small dog, you know, quick characteristics, but you didn't add anything. You selected something from the population. What we see in nature, what we see in the laboratory, is very highly bounded variation, cyclic variation. That's, for example, bin, um, uh, finch beaks in the Galap uh, Galapagos Island. That's about all we see. Small variations. Why is that if Darwinian theory is correct? These are evidentiary points that I think need to be stressed, need to be examined openly, honestly. And they never are, of course. Never are. Now, I'm not trying to challenge anything. I just want to get my science straight. That's fair enough. Okay. That's well, fair enough. Last month, you taught how mutations were genetic disasters. How, by natural selection, can they randomly produce new and better structures? That's a good question. Good question. The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. Um, as far as we know, and that's a considerable problem, not an overwhelming problem for a scientific theory. There are plenty of scientific theories that lasted a long time with absolutely no evidence. Um, but the idea that, that mutations are the driving force encounters are fatal difficulties. Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. Now, there's a, a large question here. If I take a copy of Windows um, 2000 XP and I start introducing random changes, uh, within a very short while, the code will crash. The whole system will be useless. Why exactly is this not happening in living systems? I don't want a lot of hand-waving in response. I want a precise quantitative answer. Living systems don't experience catastrophic failure under random mutations because. And if you know, tell me. I'll take your call day or night. What I've observed is that nature builds on previously established levels of complexity. This is a great general natural law that your own senses will confirm for you, but that has never been allowed into the canon of science. The way the universe works is upon a, com upon a platform of previously achieved complexity, chemical, electrical, social, biological, whatever, new forms of complexity can be built that cross these ontological boundaries. In other words, what I mean by that is that biology is based on complex chemistry, 
but it is more than complex chemistry. Social systems are based on the organization that is animal life, and yet it is more than animal life. So this is a general law of the universe overlooked by science, that out of complexity emerges greater complexity. We could almost say that the universe, nature, is a novelty-conserving or complexity-conserving engine. It makes complexity, and it preserves it, and it uses it as the basis for further complexity. When you're presented with questions or answers about any problem, there are a few questions you can ask yourself that you should ask yourself right away. First of all, you can ask yourself, do I like this answer? And if you do, you should be suspicious because you're much more likely to accept something that appeals to you um, and, and whether it's right or not. So you, if you inherently like something, in some sense, that's a reason to be almost more suspicious of it. There's something called a cognitive bias. And what that is, is just what you described. It's where you only see things that appeal to your particular perspective. Right. And the thing is, is that it's not just the believers, followers of Christ that have a lens. Evolutionists, so-called, have a lens also. Mm. And the difference is, is that I'm aware, as a Christian, of the assumptions that I make. I make certain assumptions, like the Bible is something that you can rely on. Right. It's a reliable source of truth. I acknowledge that is an assumption. I'm not basing that assumption on scientific evidence. I just assume that. Right. Uh, now, for an evolutionist so-called per se also, they also make a lot of assumptions, but the difference is, is they refuse to call it an assumption. Um, the idea that scientists are absolutely eager to be beaten up, that's one of the myths uh, put out by the scientists, and it works splendidly so that they can avoid criticism. Um, it's been suggested that scientists have faith in their theory in the same way that religious people have faith in their God. We make a theory, we test it, and we throw it out with impunity if it's wrong. And that if there was any evidence against it, we'd throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. That's not the faith of religion. And what we have to understand is that what makes sense to the universe is not the same as what makes sense to us. And we can't impose our beliefs on the universe. And the way we get around that inherent bias is by constantly questioning both ourselves and all the information we receive from others. The popular myth of science is a uniquely self-critical institution and scientists as men who would rather be consumed at the stake rather than fudge their data. I mean, that's, that's okay for a PBS special, but that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Now, either he's a lousy artist or he's a liar. Well, it turns out he's a liar. He was convicted of fraud by his own university. Proven to be a fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's fake drawings are still used in textbooks in your state right now. There's a textbook used at the University of West Florida, in the middle of the Bible Belt. It's only been proven wrong 125 years ago. I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but that ought to be plenty of time. A uh, hundred years of fraudulent drawings suggesting embryological affinities that don't exist. That's just what I would expect if biologists were struggling to maintain a position of power in a secular democratic society. If you look at many sources, you can also quickly decide which ones are not reliable and throw them out. If they're not reliable in one case, then you should be highly suspicious of them in the future. It's often said that we humans share 50% of our DNA with bananas, 80% with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. Taken literally, those numbers make it sound like we could pluck one cell from a chimp and one from a human, pull out the tangled bundles of DNA known as chromosomes, unroll each one like a scroll, and read off two nearly identical strings of letters. But in reality, the human and chimp scrolls don't sync up so easily. In the six to eight million years since we split from our last common ancestor, chance mutations and natural selection have changed each of our genomes in radical and unique ways. Two human scrolls fused, leaving us with 23 pairs of chromosomes to chimps 24. 
Other large mutations revised huge sections of text, duplicating a chunk of human DNA here, erasing a chunk of chimp DNA there, while throughout the scrolls, tiny mutations swapped one letter for another. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes, or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections, a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. It dawned on me right then and there that evolution was, was bankrupt as a scientific theory. Well, if that were so, if, if, if life did not originate by a naturalistic, materialistic, spontaneous process, what was the alternative explanation? Oh my God. When, when I talk about being skeptical, it is important to recognize that you can be surprised. And something that you don't think is sensible can end up being sensible. That's the way we learn things in physics. So when someone presents you with an idea that may seem strange, it's reasonable to be skeptical of it, but it's worth pursuing long enough to see if it, makes, if, if it might make sense and to listen to arguments that might be convincing that might cause you to change your mind. In fact, there's a great school of pedagogy that says the only way we actually learn anything is by confronting our own misconceptions. When you were born and you opened your eyes, you looked around, so much creation. Before you came here, so much has happened. Obviously, you did not create it. So you thought, there must be a creator. This is how you come to the creator, isn't it? The moment you thought there must be a creator, because you are in a human form, you thought it must be a big man. A small man like me cannot do all this, it must be a big man. If you were a buffalo, you would be really thinking, God is a huge buffalo. Isn't it so? Yes or no? You go and ask a buffalo and see, a buffalo will insist, God is a huge buffalo. Whatever you knowledge, have, knowledge you have about God is just pure nonsense, cultural nonsense. Depending upon which kind of culture you are in, that kind of God you have, isn't it? Outside the ven of culture lies an unmapped terra incognito, as vast as the new world was to the old in the 15th century, as vast as outer space appears to us now. The new world outside of culture is a world that can be conquered through vision and language. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the, the medieval woodcut of the guy sticking his head through the cogs and wheels of the cosmic machinery to observe a new world outside. The message here is, and it's, it, it's more than a message, it's a message if you just come to events like this and then go back to studying cost accounting. It's an experience, if you will, but avail yourselves of these tools. The experience is of the discovery of a new world. This is a choice you have. Do you need an explanation or are you willing to explore? If you explore, you will come to one kind of situation within yourself. If you come to agreement with some explanation that somebody gives you, 
The only choice is either to believe it or disbelieve it. If you believe it, you will become confident. It'll not bring any clarity, it'll… You, it'll bring you confidence. If you disbelieve it, you will be confused. If you're joyfully confused, it's very wonderful. But most people don't know how to handle their confusion joyfully. When they get confused, they make themselves miserable. But the most wonderful thing in human intelligence is to recognize what you do not know as you do not know. Everything that you do not know, you believe, this is a serious problem. We have done terrible things to each other simply because I believe this, you believe that. Continuing to do it even now, isn't it, across the world. If you really have a working intelligence, you must be able to see what I do not know as I do not know, isn't it? Is it not very human and very wonderful to see what I do not know, I do not know, what's the big deal about it? If you see I do not know, I do not know is an immense possibility. Only when you see I do not know, the possibility of knowing becomes a reality. If you see I do not know, the longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes a living reality. Everything that you do not know, you believe. You have to be only among your kind. If you are with another kind of people, either they should not exist or you should not exist, that's all it'll lead to. So this is something that we have to come to because human intelligence is at its best when it does not know. If I just think I know, I will become stupid because I have my conclusions about everything. If I see I do not know, intelligence is full on, isn't it? People who can cut through these many, many illusions, the illusion of materialism, the illusion of business as usual, the illusion of benevolent institutions carefully guiding us toward reasonable destinies. If you cut through all that, if you disabuse yourself of all that, uh, you, you will empower yourself to eventually be able to stand up in delicate social and political situations and just say, bullshit. <laughs> That's bullshit. Uh, there are scientists who can argue about this as well, and, and one of them, Professor Andy McIntosh, is a professor of thermodynamics. Does science support Darwin, Professor? Very definitely. Um, I've got in my hand here a feather, and if you look at a feather at uh, at the micro level, you'll see a marvellous mechanism of hooks and uh, ridges which keep the barbs together. That's just one example out of millions of examples that we can show that it isn't just the material and energy that's got to come into existence. You've got to get arrangement, and arrangement doesn't come without a mind. Okay, uh, hang on. So, sorry, can I just stop you for a, can I just stop you for a moment, Professor? Yeah, My question was, does mm -hmm. science support Darwin? No, and it doesn't support right. Darwin. It supports design, and it supports very strongly. Uh, the science strongly supports that that there is design in every living creature. And when you say design, creation. you mean a designer. You mean God as the designer. Absolutely. I, I'm a Bible-believing Christian and I support what Phil's been saying recently. But if you just come from the science, the science actually leads you incontrovertibly to seeing that there must be a design, there must be a mind behind such things as the feather that I've just shown you. You could go to molecular machines like the ATP motor. Again, they clearly show that this must have had a mind behind it. But, Professor, can I just ask you, when you say must, there must have been a mind behind it, do you say because it couldn't have been created in any other way, therefore there is a gap in our understanding, no, 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 therefore no, no, no. there must uh, be a creator? That's not what I'm saying. Okay. Many people try and accuse us of a God of the gaps idea. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in the very things that we know, that is, 
the things like the feather that I mentioned, the things like the ATP motor, which produces energy in every living cell, every single facet of that which we know strongly indicates that you've got machinery here, which indicates that a mind is behind it. It's not the things we don't know. It's the very things we do know. The DNA carries uh, digital information effectively on every single strand of the DNA. There is coded information. Coded information implies that there must have been a programmer. Let me tell you a little story. We have a marvellous college in Oxford. I'm a fellow of Green Templeton College, and we put on lovely dinners. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes the seat arrangements are fixed. So you can't adjust where you're sitting. So this night, I was sitting beside a biochemist, and he asked me what I did, and I was foolish enough to reply. I said, I'm a pure mathematician. Oh, he said, how dreadfully boring. And um, I said, oh, but, but, but I tried to make up for it by being interested in the big questions of life. He said, like what? Well, I said, like the status of the universe. Is it created or not? Oh, dear, he said, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he said, listen, the bottom line is this. I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. We're going to have an awful evening. We've nothing to talk about. And that's that. So what do you do with that? Well, I said to him, I said, you know, it's not all that bad, is it? I said, I mean, I'm fascinated by reductionism. I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? Well, he wasn't quite sure. So uh, being a kind man, I helped him a little bit. And I said, uh, you're a methodological reductionist. You take a big problem, split it into little problems, solve the little problems, get insight onto the big problem. Yes, he said, I do that. Good, I said. We agree on that then. So he was warming up, called me by my first name, so we were getting on famously. <laughs> and then I said, I think you're an ontological reductionist. That you believe ontos, Greek being, you believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, that's right. That's my basic principle. So I said, let's have an experiment then. He said, what? Here at the table? I said, sure. So I picked up the menu. And he looked at it, and it wasn't very interesting. It said roast chicken, and not even in French, in English. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 he said, what's the problem? I said, you're a reductionist. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry. I said, now look at this thing here, R, O. I said, those are marks, aren't they? But they're semiotic, Greek semion, a sign. They're marks that carry meaning. He said, that's right. OK, I said. Explain to me the semiotics of those marks in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was a silence. And then his wife said a bit loudly, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but he didn't try. I want to tell you what he said. Now, this is one of the world's top biochemists. He said, John, for 40 years I've gone into my laboratory thinking that that could be done but it can't. I was so amazed, I backtracked. I said, oh, but science has only been going 500 years or so. I said, doesn't matter. You cannot explain the semiotics bottom up. You have to introduce an intelligence. And then it dawned on him that I wasn't bright enough to have thought of the argument. He said, where did you get that argument? I said I borrowed it from a Nobel Prize winner. It, it is important to present uh, within an educational uh, establishment what is the standard, the mainstream, the canonical view. There's, there's no question about that. But at the same time, for heaven's sake, let's open up the discussion a little bit and present some countervailing views, at least to the extent of, of um, appraising Darwinian theory um, in the context that realistically portrays it for what it is. A kind of amusing 19th century collection of anecdotes that is utterly unlike anything we see in the serious sciences. That would be my favorite position. Um, yeah, biologists do agree um, that this is the correct theory for the origin and, and um, diversification of life, but here are some points you should consider as well. One, the theory doesn't have any substance. Two, it's preposterous. Three, it's not supported by the evidence. And four, the fact that the biologists are uniformly in agreement about this issue could as well be explained by some solid Marxist interpretation of their economic interests. That would satisfy me. The last thing we want to do is water down 
the teaching of biology because some people don't recognize that evolution happened. Evolution is the basis of modern biology. And in fact, if, if a lot of people don't believe it, it only means we have to do a better job teaching it. So once again, I repeat, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> I had one lady, I'm sorry, a woman, come to me after a debate one time. She was steaming down the aisle, boy, she was mad. Oh, I could tell I'm in trouble now. I stood there quivering in my boots, you know. She walked up and she said, tonight, you said, we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, well, ma'am, calm down just for a minute. I said, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, uh, where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> and you could see it was slowly dawning on her. I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? Well, as I've often said, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. The kids are going to be taught in school tomorrow in your town that the horse used to have four toes. Well, there's some things they don't tell the kids about this Eohippus to Equus series, which has been proven wrong 50 years ago, but still is in your textbooks right here in this town. They don't tell them the original so-called horse is the size of a fox. It was a meat eater and had 18 pairs of ribs. The next one had 15 pairs of ribs. And then it miraculously grew back 19 pairs of ribs as it evolved, and then back to 18. They also don't tell them the whole thing's been proven wrong a long time ago. Other examples, like the gradual evolution of the horse, have not held up under close examination. That's a polite way of saying it's proven wrong, okay? This uh, G.G. Simpson, back in 1950, said the example of the horse family has been unintentionally falsified. They knew 50 years ago this was false. Why do they keep that in your textbooks? This whole thing was made up by Othniel C. Marsh in 1874. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order the way he thought it might have happened. They were never found in that order. Modern horses are found in the same layers as the so-called ancient equus or Eohippus horse. They're found in the same layer. So it can't be the ancestor, that's for sure. The ancient horse is nothing but a hierastotherium, which is still alive today. By the way, the ribs, the toes, the teeth are very different in these animals. In South America, the fossils go exactly backwards. Instead of three-toed to one-toed, it goes one-toed to three-toed in the fossil order. They won't talk about that much, but you check it out. That's a fact, folks. They're never found in the order presented in the textbooks. Three-toed and one-toed gray side by side. Plenty of information about the, on the Internet about that. Tulsa Zoo finally took out their display because so many folks complain, why do you have this horse evolution display in the zoo? It's been proven wrong 50 years ago. Take it out. And you folks ought to get together to your, with your school board and say, look, on page whatever it is, 952 of our textbook, it says the horse evolved from a four-toed ancestor. Let's cut this page out. Well, as I've often said, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. Peabody Museum still has the horse evolution on display. As I stood, I've been there many times. It makes my blood boil every time I walk in that place. I'm standing there looking at this lie proven wrong 50 years ago while hundreds of kids come through in school groups. The kids are never told, well, this has been proven wrong, boys and girls. They asked the folks at the Tulsa Zoo before they took the display down, they said, why don't you take this display down? The zoo director said, we don't have the funding to remove it. <laughs> I've got all the letters back and forth on that. Well, as I've often said, the purpose of education... <laughs> They tell the kids they have evidence of evolution from fossils. I don't think so. Textbooks will say we started like a bacteria and slowly evolved to a human. I think that's stupid. But if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. Those trees of life that they put in the textbooks for your kids are a bunch of nonsense. And even evolutionists will admit that. Stephen Jay Gould, the Marxist professor at Harvard University, he says that evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils. It's only inference. We infer, we imply, we hope it happened this way. Darwin said, though, if my theory be true, here's his book right here. You can look on page 211. He said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. David Robb, who believes in evolution very strongly, 
says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Luther Sunderland asked all the major evolutionists, he said, where is the evidence for evolution? They all said, well, somebody else has it. We don't have it over here. So he wrote a letter to Colin Patterson. He's the director of the British Museum of Natural History. They've got the largest fossil collection in the world. He said, Mr. Patterson, I read your book on evolution. I noticed you didn't show us the missing links. Why didn't you show us the missing links? Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. There are no missing links, folks. The whole chain is missing. This one says, the humans, mammals, birds, crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Well, anything inside that circle is religious speculation. It is stupid. Reptiles produce reptiles, dogs produce dogs, people produce people, and there's never been an exception to that. Even Stephen Gould admitted the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages is a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. Charlie Lyle wrote this book, 1830. In this book, he mocked at scriptures. He hated the Bible. You can see it mocking all through the scripture here. In here, he and other fellows back in that time, uh, uh, Cuvier, uh, Steno, uh, Strata Smith, and some of these guys, they invented the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? They say each of the layers is a different age. You know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archeozoic, all them Zoic boys. And they gave each layer of rock a name, like maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, and an age, and an index fossil. This was done in 1830, way before there ever was a carbon dating or potassium argon dating or lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. Didn't exist, folks. The dating, te dating text didn't exist. They just made up these numbers out of the clear blue sky. The geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. It can only be found one place in the world, the textbooks. Now, if you get a petrified tree standing up, running through different rock layers, I don't think it's smart to say those layers are vastly different ages. Petrified trees in the vertical position, they find them all over the world. Okay, here's one from Alabama, came to come out of a seam of coal, through 20 feet of rock, into another seam of coal. They found about three dozen of them, I think, in that one little coal mine, one little area, while they're digging the coal out. Petrified trees standing up. Cookville, Tennessee. They found a bunch of them. This one's 30 feet tall, standing up. Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for their petrified trees, standing up in the vertical position. All over the area there, folks. Those trees did not get slowly covered by the sediments over millions of years. They would rot and fall down. Sometimes the petrified trees are upside down, running through many rock layers. There is no geologic column, and they know it. This fellow says, if there were a column of sediments. Uh, unfortunately, no such column exists. You know, animals don't change from uh, land-dwelling creatures to flying creatures overnight. Right. You know, exactly. it's something that takes a long, long, long time. So you automatically, from the get-go, with the theory, you have to have a long time for it to work. Right. You have to. Right. So again, there's this motivation almost, from the very beginning, to have old age. The preacher said, hey, Brother Hovind, let's go down to Rapid City, South Dakota. They've got a museum down there with a bunch of dinosaur bones. I said, all right, I like dinosaurs, let's go. So we all drove down to the museum. We, the guy had met us at the door. He said, would you like me to give you a tour? We said, that would be great, sir. The first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time scale, the big chart. They got it behind glass so the kids can't touch it. You know, this is holy, sacred. And the guy said, now, boys and girls, this layer of rock right here is about 70 million years old. My daughter was 12 at the time. She raised her hand. She said, uh, Mr., how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, well, honey, we tell the age of the layers by what kind of fossils we find in them. They're called index fossils. Oh, she said, thank you, sir. We walked around the other side of the dinosaur and we're standing over here and the guide said, now folks, these bones you're looking at are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, uh, Mr., how do you know those bones are 100 million years old? He said, honey, that's a good question. We tell the age of the bones by which layer they come from. <laughs> she said, uh, excuse me, sir, but when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? But I think thinking critically, you have to ask, why? And so when you find that a certain rock or a certain fossil 
dates so many millions of years old, what really are the assumptions that you're making? Right. And what most people don't realize is that there's a lot of assumptions that go into the various dating methods that they have. He looked back at my daughter, he said, you know, you're right, that is circular reasoning. I never thought of that before. It's all about what are the assumptions that are being made. The truth is, is that no, I mean, these dating methods can possibly, potentially give you an idea of how old something is, but still, what are the assumptions that you made going into it? Folks, geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist. I'll just give you a couple of quotes here. This guy says, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. Stratigraphy cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using only temporal concepts because circularity is inherent. You have to use circular reasoning to get it right. Well, that's stupid. And you don't need to be too bright to figure out that's stupid, okay? Science doesn't prove what's absolutely true. What it does is prove what's absolutely false. What doesn't satisfy the test of experiment, we throw out. What remains may not be true, but we shrink it down, as Sherlock Holmes would say, and what remains after all of that is done is likely to be true. The idea that uh, science is a uniquely self-critical institution is of course preposterous. Scientists are no more self-critical than anyone else. They hate to be criticized and they never criticize themselves. Uh, there are local mechanisms of criticism in science. I mean, within established theories, if somebody publishes data that um, don't work out in the right way or if there are mathematical flaws in a certain theory, uh, these tend to get known, but large global criticisms of the scientific enterprise are very, very difficult to find and uh, certainly are not being promulgated by the scientists themselves with any great ebullience or enthusiasm. Look, these people are only human. They hate criticism. Me too. Me too. It's not a surprise. We, we have to skeptically assess the information we receive. We can't be gullible. If somebody's got a lot of money at stake, a lot of research money, the words, uh, I don't have a clue, are guaranteed to end his, his or her funding. And so it's not too surprising. We want to find explanations for everything, and we create them if we need to to satisfy ourselves because we need to make sense of the world around us. We, we have to skept, skeptically assess the information we receive. We can't be gullible. Skeptically, skeptically assess the information we receive. Assess the information we receive. We can't be gullible, gullible. We create them. We create them if we need to. Gullible, gullible if we need to. We create them. That's what we do in science. Skeptically, skeptically, we create them. A kind of amusing 19th century collection of anecdotes that is utterly unlike anything we see in the serious science. We create them. We create them. If we need to. If we need to. Gullible. Gullible. We create them. We create them. If we need to. If we need to. To satisfy ourselves. How? To satisfy ourselves. That's what we do in science. To satisfy ourselves. How? To satisfy ourselves. That's what we do in science. And so skeptically can't be gullible, skeptically can't be gullible, skeptically can't be gullible, and so we can't be gullible, we create them, we create them. Gullible, gullible, we, we have to skept skeptically assess the information we receive. We can't be gullible, and that's the key point. And so it's not asking for much, is it? Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. And that is unthinkable. I mean, you're not even allowed to think that maybe there's a creator? If I met God in, in, in the unlikely event after I died, I think the first thing I'd say is, well, which one are you? Are you Zeus? Are you Thor? Are you Baal? Are you Mithras? Are you Yahweh? Uh, which God are you? Um, and uh, why did you take such great pains to conceal yourself? The source of creation, how are you going to put a definition on it? You cannot define it. You cannot understand it. You can only dissolve into it. You can experience it. You can never know it. You can't make knowledge out of it. We make a theory, we test it, and we throw it out with impunity if it's wrong. And that if there was any evidence against it, we'd throw it out like yesterday's newspaper.
That's not the faith of religion. Let's try this. Take one. In a world where laughter was king. Uh, no in a world, Jack. What do you mean, no in a world? It's not that kind of movie. Oh? Okay. In a land that... No in a land either. In a time... No, I don't think so. In a land before time. No. One man. No. When your life is no longer your own. What, what does that mean? When everything you know is wrong. That's wrong. In an outpost. No. On the edge of space. There's no space. A girl. No. Two girls. No. Now. No. More than ever. Stop it. A renegade cop. I hate you. A robot renegade cop. You're fired. You're fired. No, you're actually fired. I'm fired. Every model of the universe has a hard swallow. What I mean by a hard swallow is a place where the argument cannot hide the fact that there's something slightly fishy about it. The hard swallow built into science is this business about the Big Bang. Uh, it, it makes no sense. It is, in fact, no different than saying, and God said, let there be light. Science has made it possible that the universe didn't need God, that God is redundant. That's a dramatic concept. Now, science doesn't require there not to be a God, but as Steve Weinberg said, it makes it possible to have a universe without one. And that's a central possibility which makes our current understanding of the universe totally different than it's been for the last 2,000 years. And I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang is a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. Before the 1960s, when the Big Bang Theory came in, people thought that the uh, whole universe was eternal, governed by eternal mathematical laws. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, uh, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. If we're talking about universes that spring from nothing, in a single moment, for no reason, I mean that if you can believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most improbable proposition the human mind can conceive of. I challenge you to top it. Get out of the booth, Jack. No, I like it in here. <laughs>